Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia and I'm also currently a Danish Diabetes and Endocrine Academy Visiting Professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. The idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the absolute who's who of exercise research, so exercise physiology, exercise metabolism and exercise and health. And what I want is for you to get your information from the research experts rather than from influencers. And indeed, today I bring to you Dr. Edward Chambers from Imperial College London. He's an expert on gut microbiota and exercise. So he's shown that um, fiber ingestion results in production of short chain fatty acids by the gut microbiota, and they can affect various organ systems, including the skeletal muscle, and potentially affect exercise performance. He's also shown that these short chain fatty acids can affect appetite. And in very interesting studies, he's shown that if you do carbohydrate ingestion, uh, with and without exercise, they can both have effects on your appetite. I found this very interesting. I think you will too, so stick around. Hi, Ed, how are you? Thanks for coming on Inside Exercise. I have I've, uh, was amazed to see some of your work. So to be honest, I hadn't really seen, I hadn't put together who you were. And then um, it's really interesting. So so we'll talk about how you, you did some of the, the early sort of classic stuff with, um, what is it, swirling carbohydrate around in your mouth, spitting it out and having effects, which is really interesting, which I've seen that work. But then your more, more recent stuff with um, the gut microbiota and affecting muscle metabolism and maybe exercise performance, who knows, we'll talk about that. And, you know, short, fain, short chain fatty acids being broken down in your gut and being put in the blood and all that. So very interesting work. Thank you so much. Absolutely, a pleasure to be invited on and join such a illustrious list of previous <laughs> guests you had on. So I hope I don't let you down. No, you won't let me down. So we already had a chat a few days ago, and it was great. So um, we already know a bit about what we're going to talk about. But, but I wonder if we can start off. Obviously, we'll talk about those things I just said then. But why don't you tell us what is the gut microbiota and why do we need to sort of think about it and why is it important? Um, well, I think from a historical perspective, it's always been known that there are these bacteria within the gut. Um, and it was really only sort of, 20, sort of 15, 20 years ago that advancement in sort of sequencing technology just allowed researchers to look in more detail, sort of characterize the composition of uh, the gut. And then it was just found that there was lots of these associations with uh, positive or negative health outcomes with um, the composition of the bacteria and their metabolic activity. So um, yeah, it's a lot of the work, the majority of the work that I've done myself personally over the last 10 years has been more focused on uh, non-digestible carbohydrates, so dietary fiber mm. and how they influence both um, the populations of bacteria that you get in the gut and the metabolites that are produced. So predominantly these short chain fatty acids, um, yeah. which believe to be important both substrate and signaling molecules um, and they're having these impacts on host health. Yes so as you say I guess I guess we've always known there's bacteria down there doing things so vitamin K um, you know that's when I sort of heard about bacteria but then as you say it's become more but now it's just like all the rage and um, I'll ask you later on about all these you know probiotics and yeah uh, your courts and all these things that actually do anything or not but um, I guess um, okay, so why don't we talk about, oh, oh yeah, but then, then I started hearing, you know, things about how many kilograms there are, and why don't you just tell us some of that sort of background? Well, it um, is just, when you actually, you know, say so there are bacteria within the gut, it's, uh, uh, I think it's when you actually consider the total weight of these bacteria, it really puts it into perspective, so it's sort of estimated that, you know, any sort of adult set, stands on their weighing scales it's around about one and a half to two kilos of your total body weight is just the bacteria in your gut so this doesn't just reside within what we think in terms of the large intestine it's been becoming more apparent now that these bacteria in different populations exist throughout the gi tract so say all the way from the mouth oh. all the way um to the rectum so yep yeah, which would be having major influences on how the food particularly the food that we consume how that's actually degraded and the metabolites that are produced yeah well, that's what i was wondering because I was, I was kind of assuming it was the large intestine because that's what you hear about you know vitamin k and things like that 
So then I was thinking, well, I guess they wouldn't survive in the in the stomach because it's like very acidic, pH two or something. But and but then you've got the small intestine. But you're actually saying this, and, and we know it's in the mouth, right? Because exactly, yeah, yeah. To exercise and and, there's evidence as well yeah. that what you actually the bacteria that you have in the mouth that's able to actually obviously if you swallow this bacteria it, it is, does translocate and actually have an influence on the bacteria that's actually developed further down in the gut but yeah you do have you know, like the bacteria within the gut it's very sensitive to different phs as you say different oxygen levels of saturation so by far the most favorable conditions are in the large intestine the, like the colon but you know, throughout the small intestine you do have these populations of bacteria and it's really the biggest difficulty is obviously um measuring these bacteria because of its inaccessibility it's a bit of a black box really in terms of how we we'll perhaps get on to in terms of what these no novel methods that are emerging to allow you to actually sample from different uh gastric anatomical sites so rather than relying on stool samples which is the, co the classic method to look at gut bacterial composition but they're thought to really just provide you that snapshot of changes within the colon um, and you can't really, from a stool sample, get sort of dynamic sort of changes, perhaps from a postprandial, during a postprandial state, or perhaps in response to acute exercise or in the recovery period, to know how and how much do things actually change within the gut. Yeah, so I mean, in the mouth, because you were talking about the whole way through, so I know in the mouth, I've done a bit of nitrate stuff, so people would have heard about, you know, nitrate can get converted to nitrite by the bacteria in the mouth, etc., and actually, that makes me think, because I'm thinking, what order should we go through? It seems we're talking about the mouth. What a great segue to talk about, um, you know, what you did in a previous life, I guess, during your yeah. PhD with the mouth swirling stuff. And then we'll, then we'll spend the rest of the time talking about the, the gut microbiota. Why don't you tell us about yeah. that? Well, so, yeah, this was, what, 20, I think it was published 2009. So I did my PhD in the University of Birmingham from 2004 with uh, Professor David Jones, uh, who's sadly uh, uh, no longer with us. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a like, fantastic opportunity, great um, you know, following on the work that uh, Jimmy Carter had done with um, Asker Eukendrup, like suggesting that, you know, particularly the benefits of, some of the benefits of carbohydrate uh, ingestion during these shorter sort of hour bouts of exercise could be coming just from the sensing of carbohydrate within the oral cavity. So yeah, we uh, followed on that work and uh, you know, uh, um, I repeated that observation and then using functional um, magnetic resonance imaging, sort of showing that you do get these differences in sort of central reward activity um, in, with sort of a caloric sweetness compared to these artificial sweeteners that could be providing this mechanism for uh, the improvement in performance, that if you're you know, just from tasting a, a sugar, um, that perhaps this is providing this feed forward response um, to the brain, letting it know, letting it know that nutrients are on the way in the uh, the, the GI tract. But um, I think that it was a wonderful work to be involved with. But I'm sure anyone who's done these mouth rinse studies knows it's not the most uh, how should we put it uh, glamorous of lifestyles having cyclists spitting next to swirl these and spit at you so um whilst it was an exciting it wasn't something i wanted to uh, necessarily continue uh, in that area and uh, yeah so i just um at the same time i got interested in turn in the area where sort of exercise and appetite responses and just became fascinated with sort of that, like, human appetite regulation um and a so postdoc opportunity came up at imperial college working with um Gary Frost, who I still work with now, um, and really this went, you know, went from the you know, digestible carbohydrates in the mouth to non-digestible carbohydrates mm -hmm. at the other end of the GI tract. So mm -hmm. I really took a, you know, taken a journey from one end of the GI tract to the other. Mm -hmm. um, so really now this, say, focusing on how dietary fibres, these non-digestible carbohydrates, how they can be impacting uh, human health. Yes. Now, before we get away, because I I did a whole bunch of stuff. My PhD even was carbohydrate ingestion and looking at metabolism and things like that and performance. Before I let you go with that, just got a few thoughts because we literally were doing like carbohydrate ingestion during prolonged exercise, you know, the classic sort of coil, you know, time to exhaustion yeah. and over three hours and trained and untrained and biopsies and whatever. 
But then we also, um, when I finished my PhD, I thought, what about shorter stuff? So we did an hour, and mm. we were one of the ones that didn't really find the effect of uh, carbohydrate ingestion on performance over an hour. But then other people did, and it was like this all this talk about how the hours are cut off, and some find it, and some don't, and whatever. And then it makes you think, hang on a minute, but if they're getting these reward centers, obviously my people were drinking it and swallowing it and everything. Yeah. Um, I guess we're, say, we're not saying that they don't get anything from the carbohydrate. I guess it depends how long you go. But they're getting, so why, in theory then, because we generally say like an hour is a cutoff, but in theory, if they're getting this reward, right, wouldn't you think it would, would help them over like 20 minutes even, but it doesn't? No, um, they might, well, from memory, if I say from memory from my own studies, it, from we tracked the changes in power output from the cyclists over the sort uh -huh. of hour time trial the effects did become apparent of 30 minutes to you know mm. onwards so perhaps yeah. there is a you know there is a, a a time frame where there is no effect but yeah but i think the looking back after we had the chat a few days ago I look back on the papers in that area and i do think the, the other paper that's most fascinating that jimmy carter and asker did was the showing no effect where you infuse the carbohydrate directly in the circulation and again that didn't really get it obviously it, it, it's got sides but it, that's just fascinating to me in terms of so if you completely avoid the the gi tract and all the signals and you know mm -hmm. neural signaling and hormones that would possibly be released from a carbohydrate solution you completely bypass that you show no effect on performance at all so yeah it's, mm -hmm. whether it's, it's this carbohydrate acting as a signal as well as a substrate that appears to be important wow that's weird and I guess they were, I, I have to admit, I didn't see that paper either. I guess they were, did they do like a placebo? Did they do like one infusion that was, I, I don't blame you if you don't remember this, but one that was saline, one that was carbohydrate. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the saline control, oh, yeah. there's carbohydrate. Wow, okay. So again, it's, just, interesting. it's very similar to what, you know, the incretin effect, essentially, that you see with, um, yeah, carbohydrate consumption, that, you know, if you consume carbohydrate orally, you get particularly things like GLP-1 being released, this which you perfect. don't see. If um, mm -hmm. if the carbohydrates infuse, so again, it's it's really fascinating. But yeah, what what is what is carbohydrate doing in the gut essentially beyond providing an energy source? Well, this is not a setup, but it sounds like it. But I'm back at, in Copenhagen, so I've been here 2013, 2016, 2019, 2023, and we're actually finishing up and we're writing up the study where we did we compared a clamp. So we did one legged exercise. Yeah. And then waited four hours and then did a whole whole body clamp and looked at glucose uptake into the previous exercise leg and the rest of the leg. So we had femoral artery and femoral vein catheters in both legs, um, all sorts of stuff. Fused mm. micro bubbles, look at muscle blood flow using contrast lens, ultrasound, all sorts of stuff. But basically, we find higher glucose uptake, especially in the exercise leg, right? Previous exercise mm. leg. But the interstitial glucose drops like crazy. And it's because you've clamped it at five millimole. Right. Yeah, you know, clamp is not normal physiology. Yeah, so because yeah. you clamp it at five millimole, you don't get the big increase in glucose delivery. Mm. So you've got this insulin stimulating glute four onto the membrane. You're taking up bucket loads of glucose, but you're not delivering enough. So the interstitial yeah. glucose in the muscle drops. So we have these probes in the muscle. I'm not talking about continuous glucose monitoring. I'm talking about probes in the muscle. Yeah. So now we've done exactly what you're probably thinking. We've done a follow up where we did a meal instead of a clamp. So one yeah. negative exercise. And then they had meals instead of the clamp. And we actually get like double the glucose uptake in the leg yeah. at the same insulin. Just, and it's because, as you say, you're actually getting, well, there's a GLP-1 and stuff. But it's also the fact that you're actually getting an increase in your glucose, which is what happens when you have a meal. Yeah. And your interstitial glucose does not drop. So anyway, I know I'm just off on a tangent here, but it fits well with, with what you're saying as, as well. So it's really interesting. All right, so we've talked enough about that. And indeed, I've gone off on a tangent. Oh, yeah, but the other thing we talked about the other day, maybe if we just bring it up while we're talking about this, yeah. is how when we did our carbohydrate ingestion studies, we had like double traces. So we were infusing stabilized terpene glucose whole body, and then we had a radioactive glucose in the drink. And I was telling you how we could only account. Now, I did not go back and look it up. I think we only accounted for like 34% or something of the carbohydrate they drank actually showed up in the blood during the two hours of exercise. I'm not saying, saying it didn't show up later. And what did you say in response to that, which I hadn't thought about? Well, it, it just depending on the intensity of the exercise, I don't know if you can remember, would it be like 
moderate to high intensity exercise. You didn't have you know, reductions in gastric emptying and absorption. So it's just how much of this carbohydrate you're consuming is just sitting in the guts. And we you know we know there are these bacteria that are present in the small intestine. And whether you're just providing a substrate, this digestible carbohydrate is actually you know, rather than be able to be absorbed from the gut lumen is actually acting as a substrate for the bacteria so it'd be fascinating to know you know how much of these this carbohydrate that's consumed during exercise how much do, could it is it actually being fermented by bacteria and are you producing other substrates um which could then be absorbed and used by the host but again who knows i don't know if that study's been done but I'm sure if anyone's got uh, old samples of uh, you know with of a plasma um where they where they provided volunteers with a 13c labeled sports drink during exercise if you could look at the 13c labeled short chain fatty acids it would be a fascinating outcome there you go all right so that introduces us to the the short chain fatty acids so so I know you've done these studies, as you say, with, um, you know, I guess, fermenting of fiber to short chain fatty acids. And then what, what affects, I guess, um, how much of that happens, I guess, is, you know, and are we talking about like a tiny amount of, you know, the, the, of short chain fatty acids that are produced or is it quite a lot? And, and what effects do they have? So I, I see you've talked about effects on muscle metabolism and, and maybe even effects. I don't know if you're just hypothesizing, but. Um, yeah, well, it's all very. It's incredibly individual, the response you get. So depending on someone's pre-existing gut microbial composition, so essentially how much sacrolytic bacteria you have, so how much bacteria you have that's able to ferment carbohydrate, that will obviously have an influence on the, yeah, the fermentation potential that can occur in the, in the gut. So you could provide, say, a, 20, a, a meal containing 20 grams of fermentable fiber to two people, who've got very different gut microbiota composition and get very different levels of short chain fatty acids that are okay. produced. You do get, if you continually provide high levels of fermentable fiber to an individual, your gut adapts over time. So you know, within sort of you know, two to four days, you will see this increase in the abundance of these sacrolytic bacteria. So I think that you know, when I first started in this, in this research area that I knew nothing about dietary fiber or non-digestible mm. carbohydrates. I just assumed that they work. This can, no, if you consumed fiber, it's a completely inert substance that just passes straight through mm. you. That was my understanding. I just hadn't really appreciated that you know, bacteria within our gut is able to actually say ferment these carbohydrates and produce these short chain fatty acids, which are, energy substrates so this sort of textbook ex, um, number that's sort of given is around about uh, 500 millimoles per day of short chain fatty acid you produce so if you look at the actual theoretical energy yield from that it's around about um it's about 75 uh, kilocalories a day so around you know okay. around three to five percent of your total energy intake is these short chain fatty acids but so it's a small but appreciable amount of human energy requirements come from um the um, okay. yeah, this energy yield from the particularly from the colon and i just say and, and will that de depend on how much naturally it depend on how much fiber or digest you could say are you calling it digestible fiber what are you calling so this non, non, non digestible this is the problem in the literature there are so many different terms that probably okay. mean the same thing in terms of people use like non digestible carbohydrate but mm -hmm. so essentially that's just a fiber again people use fermentable uh, carbohydrates or fermentable fibers and that's just okay. a not all you have to remember not all fibers are fermentable you do have certain fibers like wheat bran that is completely inert so that they are your things that are beneficial for health because they do just improve your um uh laxation so in terms of you know, keeping the bowel frequency and bowel movements going um okay. and and you do have other diet fibers again this is going off slightly that are non-fermentable but have this um uh, gelling properties within the uh, oh, 
vis you know, increase the viscosity of the luminal content. So they're thought to improve health by sort of slowing down the absorption of both uh, uh, carbohydrate, so glucose and fat from the intestine. Um, so, it, but again, then you have these fermentable fibers. And again, the more fermentable fiber that you actually consume in your diet, so particularly coming from fruits and vegetables, then you will get a greater amount of short chain fatty acids being produced in your gut. Okay, so you're saying maybe on average, um, it's about 70, we're only talking about 75 calories a day, yeah. is that right? So it's a That's relatively good. small amount. But in theory, if you want to be a stickler, you know, you look at the label and it says, uh, well, I know you just said it's not all fiber, it's the fermentable fiber. But if you were a stickler, you could look at the label and say, well, it's probably slightly more than that. It's probably about three calories more than that because some of that's going to be fermented. <laughs> Is that right? And they wouldn't exactly. for that. Exactly. And you just don't know as well in terms of, again, individual variability is, um, is huge. So it really depending on someone's get gut transit time. So if you have a very slow gut transit time, you're going to perhaps absorb a lot more or digest and absorb a lot, a lot more carbohydrate than someone who has a quick gas, a, okay. a emptying time. So more of the carbohydrate is going to get down to the lower gut and be available for fermentation. So again, there's many factors that influence how much short chain fatty acids are actually produced. Okay. And these, and these fermentable fibers, you, you just touched on then, is it, it for, uh, you know, how will we know, because you know, he said bran is not, but I'm just trying to get a bit of a, is there something on the on the on the label where you go, oh, that, that would be a fermentable fiber, or is it no. not really? Very rarely would you see on any you know the ingredient list that you know what type of fiber is actually in it and know whether that is a fermentable uh, fiber or not. But is it fruit? Did you say fruit and vegetables? Is that what you said? Or? Fruits, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. They're your classic. You know, would okay. contain some element of fermentable uh, material. Right. Right. So, okay, so you've eaten, we've eaten this stuff and some of it's get, got fermented depending on our own individual gut microbiota, I guess. Yeah. Now, what determines, again, I know it's maybe not what you've looked at, but what determines that? Is it, is it things like, you know, how much probiotics and prebiotics and things you eat? Or is it, is it part of it like even nature? And, you know, it's, it's part of it, you know, what you've inherited from your parents or... Or was it how many Yakuts you knocked back? <laughs> yeah, there is within, if you look, there's been the Human Microbiome Project you know, it was provided by far the best evidence for this. So I think there's around, you know, there's about 2,000 different bacterial species, and some of these are known to produce, you know, are known short chain fatty acid producers. Um, there's, a, there's known to be a gender difference in your microbiome composition, this big. Um, uh, ethnic differences as well but the biggest influence are these lifestyle factors so I think the two being again diet what you're actually putting in your gut to actually what substrates you're exposing these bacteria to to allow them to produce these metabolites uh, and the other one being uh, uh, medication as well so antibiotic usage mm. so obviously if you have um, a course of antibiotics that's going to to some extent um knock well, not completely knock out but do reduce the number of bacteria that you do have in the gut um and your ability to produce these short chain fatty acids yes now so i remember my mum used to always say because i was always on antibiotics i was always like this sickly kid always coughing i was always on antibiotics yeah. i don't know how she was onto this because i'm 61 and i was a kid but it was always like Ah, oh, you know, we need, need to have some yogurt to put back in these um, bacteria and things. And she was even like, it's amazing to think now because we just don't bother. But she used to put milk in the, you know, in a, in a bowl and add a little bit of yogurt and stick it up. In the, I remember she'd climb up the ceiling. It was warmer up there and put a towel over it and make her own yogurt and just keep topping it up. You know, use the, the bit left over and top it up, put it in the milk again. So um, that was pretty amazing. What a great mum. Um, anyway, it wasn't, just, it wasn't just for just for my, you know, antibiotic stuff. But yeah, she was on yeah. all that. Well, maybe I got the timeline wrong somewhere, but definitely. And it was all this talk about acidophilus and whatever in yogurt. Is that still a thing? And and do need to, do people need to be thinking about 
um, you know, oh, yogurt, uh, kimchi, you know, all these fermented things. I imagine it's way too complicated because, you know, you just said there's 2,000 different species. How do you know, oh, this kimchi has got the one that I need because I took antibiotics yesterday or something? Exactly. It's, it's very, very complicated. But going back to um, child, like this is, it's a massive area in terms of this establishing a say a healthy gut microbiome in, you know, when, when you are young. So it's obviously known that the two biggest factors there are the mode of delivery. So a cesarean delivery versus like your like oh. vaginal delivery has a massive influence. And again, the other big influence being if you're breastfed or bottle fed. So what's really interesting, mm -hmm. the studies that are coming out now in that area are identifying that the, um, the amount of fiber that's actually in breast milk so these human oligosaccharides, mm -hmm. like these human say, um, fi like fibers, they're actually in um, breast milk. So there's been some work done by the um, uh, manufacturers of bottle feed to actually try and mimic this levels of fiber in uh, bottle feed. And again, it shows um, considerable Im Im impacts on establishing um, the, the uh, microbiome that you get um, mm -hmm in those early years, which seems to be very, very important. So it's important to be uh, born vaginally, so that, you know, that yeah. and also to be breastfed. Yeah. yeah. To get the, well, those are, the two, does, sorry. those are does the that two. Does set you up for later? Sorry, does that then set you up for later or is it just a good start sort of thing? Exactly, it's a good start. But I think that what we're identifying is if those, um, factors haven't occurred what can we actually do to essentially boost mm -hmm. that the child up to uh, you know uh, to make sure that they are um, exposed to the conditions that would help support a healthy gut microbiome all right and then if you have bacteria i guess you know throughout your oh, sorry not, uh, antibiotics throughout your life is it is it a good um, idea to then you know after you've had the antibiotics or why you're having them to sort of try and get and this is again i don't know anything about this stuff so um what would you go oh let's let's hoe into some yo or let's get some kimchi and well it's, it's an ongoing area yeah. it's an ongoing yeah. area of research really it's particularly that period of post as you said once you've come off the antibiotics what's the most appropriate diet to re-establish your gut mm -hmm. microbiome uh, and again are there various supplements are there certain pre or post uh, probiotics that are would be most beneficial to get your to it really allow that recovery of the gut microbiome as quickly as possible. All right, and these short chain fatty acids, how short are they? And 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 then tell me what what do they do? So let's assume we kind of we kind of been getting there, and I think I could take you off on a tangent again. That's all right. Um, so so you had, you had your meal, yeah. Yeah. Then what happens? So you have, you have your meal. You get the, the amount of the fermentable material in it is fermented, and you obviously you produce these short chain fatty acids as your major metabolic end product. So the classic or the most the most abundant short chain fatty acids are acetate, propionate, and butyrate. So that's C two, C three, and C four. There are other short chain fatty acids up to. C8, I think, but they are produced in a lot lower levels compared to um, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. So when people say short chain fatty acids, I think predominantly they're the three that they're talking about. And you say C2, so it's just two carbons, just so people know. So, so when you have um, glucose, for example, it's six carbons. Exactly. Uh, and then fatty acids are, are generally 16 carbons or 18 carbons. There are the the um, you know the monosaturates and the you know that are 22 carbons and things, but we normally talk about when we talk about fatty acid oxidation, we're talking about the 16 fatty acids, the 18 fatty acids. So you're saying these are two, three, and four, and there may be some C. Is that what you said? Maybe some yeah, that, up to sort of uh, C, from that C6 to C8. I can't remember because it's not okay. something that I look at. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Something I'm, 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 we focus on those three um, predominantly. And it's as you say, because they're these short chain, they are very versatile metabolites. Um, they are, you know, uh, so once they are produced in the gut lumen, they are rapidly uh, taken up. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of butyrate is used by colonocytes as an energy source. So that's one of the reasons that sort of high fiber diets or high short chain fatty acid production is good for health. It's because you're providing more 
of a preferred energy substrate for your colonocyte to actually remain healthy. Um, on a site, what, so sites are cells, so are cells in the colon, is that what you're saying? Essentially, that's what I'm So in the colon, so you're not talking about ones that have got in the blood and all that, you're talking about ones that it's just stayed there and it's been an energy source for those colon yeah. cells. Yeah? Exactly. So again, it's just, um, there's very nice work done just showing that uh, fibre intake in particular and levels of short chain fatty acids being associated with gut health and thinking that butyrate is the key um, short chain fatty acid um, in that process. But then you have um, the remaining butyrate and acetate and propionate, a lot of that gets um, extracted by the liver first of all. So acetate can be used, it can be directly oxidized by the liver or it can be used as a lipogenic um, precursor. Um, and then and propionate itself is actually as a C3 um, metabolite, that's actually gluconeogenic. So you can actually produce glucose from propionate. So again, they are um, not just as substrates themselves, they can act as precursors for other important uh, metabolites okay. and then the remainder that then doesn't get used by the liver can then enter the peripheral circulation and get used by other organ sites in like such as skeletal muscle okay so just just to um just keep in mind that there's sometimes a bit of a broader audience so gluconeogenesis so you're saying some of the short chain fatty acids can be involved in gluconeogenesis which basically is genesis of new glucose so there can be yeah. these two carbons, three carbons, four carbons can be put together to make the six carbon glucose that goes in the blood, maintains your glucose levels. And then you said uh, lipogenic. So that's um, uh, generating uh, lipo, which is fat. So it can be involved in producing fats in the liver to be either used by the liver or pumped out to be used uh, elsewhere in the body. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And again, acetate as well is used, um, uh, can be used for ketone body synthesis as well. So again, they can just be recycled and convert. So it's important to when you thinking of short chain fatty acids that they are they don't just stay as those short chain fatty acids. They mm. are they're used as building blocks for other important okay. tablets as well. And this, again, it, this was known, this has been known for decades that you know we produce these short chain fatty acids. But it was I think it was 20, was it to around about 2000, yeah, about 2000, 2002, around that time, it was identified that there were these um, novel uh, G-protein couple receptors. So basically just receptors throughout, which were expressed throughout the body, um, which no one knew what they were receptors for. And it was just found that they were receptors for short chain fatty acids. So as well as acting as um, these energy substrates, what's sort of shown as well is that these short chain fatty acids signal via these G-protein coupled receptors. So uh, GPR41 and GPR43, they are called. So we've looked at that. A lot of the work that I initially did at Imperial was looking at how these short chain fatty acids signal on these short chain fatty acid receptors in the um, uh, L cell in the gut, which actually secretes these appetite suppressive hormones. So that's what we were looking at in terms of perhaps one of the reasons why high fiber diets are good for you is that you're producing these short chain fatty acids and via stimulating this short chain fatty acid receptor in the gut, you get more release of these appetite suppressive hormones and people mm -hmm. feel less hungry. Okay. All right. So that's an interesting one. Um, so yeah, the appetite, we kind of talked beforehand, there's two, two bits to this. There's the effect on metabolism in the muscle, for example. Yeah. And, you know, this is sort of almost like an energy substrate side to it, as well as the, the producing fats, et cetera. But there's also the appetite part. Maybe we'll get back to the appetite part later. Yeah, yeah because I think that it's, I was going to say the, the yeah. whole energy substrate area is particularly fascinating in, in terms of the, the work that's been done in rodent models, linking that with um, endurance performance. Um, mm -hmm. So there's been studies done say in rodent models where particularly what they've done is taken sort of normal sort of wild type mice compared to those given antibiotics to sort of knock out um, short chain fatty acid production and what you see in these experiments consistently is that these mice have reduced endurance capacity so where and what they 
studies have also shown is that if you then infuse the um, short chain fatty acids perhaps into the circulation at a rate that matches what would be produced in the gut, you can then restore that um, exercise performance. But I'm not, you know, I'm not aware of any studies that have been able to translate this into humans so far, uh, but there is definite evidence from um, rodent models that the uh, short chain fatty acid producing capacity from the gut seems to be linked with endurance performance. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, I know we talked a few days ago when we talked, you were saying that, and you kind of touched on it there, there maybe, the translation of some of the rodent studies to humans. So I guess that makes me think, because I know we know that rats, uh, and I think mice, they rely more on sort of extracellular. So, you know, we rely a lot on, you know, our muscle glycogen is really important, yeah. obviously, and we've got intramuscular fats as well. Um, the rodents tend to rely more on extracellular. So the, the fatty acids in the blood and the glucose. And indeed, you can far, if you fast a rat or a mouse, they're actually exercise longer to endurance yeah. than if you don't fast them because they've got all this fatty acids in the blood and all this, and they can just use it when it, that doesn't happen for us. So I, I wonder if, because you wouldn't think that these short chain fatty acids would be that important, you know, for no, exactly. you know, if you're saying about small amounts, small calories compared to just your normal long chain fatty acids. Exactly. I'm, I'm, skeptical shall we say of the translational uh, potential of this so first of all you touched on it in terms of there's obvious species differences so I, I think in both mice and rats I think if you look at the size of the colon in terms of its relation to total body weight it's considerably bigger in the in rodents compared to humans so the you know the capacity to produce short chain fatty acids in terms nice. of its potential to influence whole body metabolism is probably a lot greater so i think i may have mentioned earlier i think this is the textbook um sort of amount of short chain fatty acid that's produced per day is around about 500 millimoles so that sort of what's that in terms of per hour i can't know so even if you say say 60 calories a day that's only what two and a half calories an hour something like that I think I scribbled down earlier mm -hmm. so even if you were able to you know a tenfold increase in this during exercise it's going to be minimal in terms of a drop mm -hmm. in the ocean compared to the total energy requirements of the actual exercise yeah, especially so, how much fat we've got you know like yeah. even the the leanest person has enough fat to go hundreds of hours uh, exactly exercise. and um it's that whole uh, that the how translatable the exercise performance sorry exercise capacity um model in a rodent is to humans it might be into a very very ultra ultra endurance events where you have more or less depleted your body you know or you're running very low on energy sources that having this extra generation of available substrate coming from your from fermentation in the gut might be important but then again you know it seems to be uh, if it's just a matter of just providing extra substrate why wouldn't you just consume a carbohydrate sports drink that exactly. would just have exactly the same effect <laughs> if it's just a matter of getting more substrate coming from the gut just consume a sports drink it's going to be a lot easier than getting your bacteria uh, to have to ferment some fiber um, but then it goes back to perhaps these short chain fatty acids aren't providing um, necessarily improving performance through providing a substrate, um, they're known to, uh, the influence they have on skeletal muscle, or, um, it's been shown that they influence glycogen uh, metabolism, and they also increase um, uh, whole body fat oxidation as well. So again, whether there could be some translation to humans that these short chain fatty acids might affect um, exercise performance by altering substrate utilization. I think that's an interesting area of future work, but I'm not aware of anyone, as I said, who's actually shown that by you know, dramatically changing short chain fatty acid levels during exercise, that you get differences in mm -hmm. substrate utilization or effects on performance. 
especially I guess at physiological, because I guess they could infuse a whole bucket load of uh, short chain fatty acids and see they probably would find something, right? Because you're just exactly. pouring in a whole bunch of um, energy and maybe other bits and pieces as well, as you said, maybe having other bits and pieces effects. Um, but it doesn't mean that's what's happening in real life, as you said, because it's such a small amount. Now, yeah. I'm interested, uh, so what did you say there that the short chain fatty acids may, again, I don't know if this is rodent studies or what, but may affect glycogen, what, so affecting, uh, what, increased glycogen storage or, and then what effect it, on muscle, does increase, uh, on fat? It's been shown to particularly acetate, which is the most abundant, which is the most abundant short chain fatty acid, particularly in the peripheral circulation. There's been work um, done in a variety actually of um, species showing that it does affect um, glucose uptake into muscle. So it, it does increase, um, glu uh, seems to alter the glute four transporter, so ability of the muscle cell to increase glucose uptake. And as, as well, it appears to have a, a vasodilatory effect as well on muscle. So it also just increases the blood flow to the muscle, um, wow. which again would have well, this. at physiological levels, that, that's kind of surprising, I guess. At physiological levels, or yeah, yeah. So that's what's been uh, in. That's there's been increases for what translocation and blood flow. So delivery. Yeah. And, and this has been shown flow. mostly actually with um, uh, vinegar supplementation, because obviously that's a high source of wow. acetic acid. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, do an OG an oral glucose tolerance test with vinegar which must taste vile uh, yeah. you do actually though, see greater uptake of the um, ingested carbohydrate and again it's just w whether that would then um, could you know, be used as a, a substrate wow, you know, that's a weird one. Uh, your, you know, muscle glycogen breakdown who knows or even in the post-exercise state actually boost uh, glycogen synthesis again this interesting wow. areas of future work okay um, okay, so what about appetite? So uh, actually, before we get to appetite, I want to think some more about, so how quickly do these things, you, you touched on earlier, how quickly do these things change if you change your diet? Like, do you get a change in your microbiota? And um, and is it different in sort of lean people, obese people, all, the, all these sort of, sort of questions? It was, it was thought that it was a quite slow process. So in terms of it was thought that you, you know, once you reached adulthood, you sort of had a sort of stable microbiota, you know, a personalized microbiota, depending on your early life, that was relatively stable. And any sort of particularly dietary effect would be quite slow. But there was a study, classic study, it was published in Nature, in, uh, it was in 2014, I can't remember the name of the first author, but they did a inpatient study where it was highly controlled like comparing a sort of a plant-based diet which was very rich in fiber versus an animal-based diet which is very you know, de more most depleted in uh, dietary fiber but obviously very high in you know animal proteins and they showed within sort of 24 hours i think it was only a four-day intervention but they just really showed how rapid the gut microbiome in terms of you get the changes in the composition and the metabolites that are produced um uh, with the interaction with the the uh, microbiota, so it changes quite rapidly. Like so, a couple Very of days, or yeah. yeah, after a couple of days, you would see um, uh, you know, dramatic changes. Okay, and what about these? Again, we've touched on this probiotics, prebiotics, um, your colts and yogurts and things like that. Do we know? Are they likely to have changes? Do you know, or has that been looked at very well? And you know, by oh. un and sort of uh, conflicted, you know, funding and <laughs> um, obviously, the, I think it's a varied, shall we say, um, uh, picture. But there are particularly related to um, uh, exercise. There's are there's nice work showing that particular the um, probiotics. Um, I think the members of I think it's the lactobacilli um, like family of uh, uh, bacterial taxa that those in probiotic form seem to particularly if an athlete's undergoing like prolonged periods of exercise endurance like repeated bouts of endurance exercise you do get improvements in immune function so literally less like you know, uh, less um, uh, prevalence of like upper respiratory tract infections so that's I think in terms of 
with altering sort of bacterial composition through probiotics and exercise. That's the strongest evidence I think that's out there at the moment. Well, that's interesting. So I had Michael Gleason on a few weeks ago and he was talking about how if you do a little bit of exercise, you'll get less upper, upper, upper airway infections and things. But if yeah. you do a whole bunch like these full on, you know, Tour de France cycles, they yeah. actually get sicker. But you're saying if they do a whole bunch of exercise and eat probiotics, that will actually reduce the likelihood of getting these upper airway infections. Yeah, don't, don't hold me to it. It's not a definite, but there's at least evidence ah. out there that, uh, you know, that from studies that that's in terms of um, probiotic, you know, altering bacterial composition through changes in specific, you know, increasing intake of particular bacterial species that's the strongest evidence out there and it would it would make sense because these bacteria obviously have could have a huge impact on the um homeostasis within the gut lumen and these repeats bouts of you know exercise stress are going to place huge demands in the gut so if you can perhaps prevent that deterioration occurring perhaps and they maintain this gut barrier integrity, then that's going to stop this you know, translocation of things from the gut lumen entering the systemic yeah. circulation, which can have you know, major implications for health and you know, development of various um, infections. Right. And again, I'm sort of rabbiting on about this, but do you think is, is just fermented probiotic um, stuff even though there's 2,000 different species and you don't know what species are in there, is it generally good just to shovel in this stuff? You know, like, like is I guess there's no way of telling at the moment, oh, you're actually low on yeah. you know, acidophilus or something. Um, you should have more acidophilus or lactobacillus or whatever you said before. At the moment, well, is it just like it's a good idea to eat fermented sort of products generally? Is that... Is that fair to say? Exactly. I think the thing is, if you've got to think of this from a sort of general population level compared to the athlete population, which is unique. So just going back to general population, um, this, uh, this is UK based data, but this is applicable to any sort of Western country that we the rec dietary recommendation for fiber is 30 grams per day. And on average, a typical adult's only consuming around about 18 to 20 grams a day. I think it's less than 10% of people eat the recommended amount of fiber. Okay. So at a general yeah. level, just eat more fiber. Just there you <laughs> eat, go. Which is yeah, I've got the wrong end of the stick going on here. I keep talking about shoveling in these um uh these bacteria, basically, but not thinking about the fact you need the fiber for the bacteria to ferment. Right? Exactly. So you yeah, exactly. You can you can increase the amount of um, sac say sacrolytic bacteria in your gut by various probiotic approaches, but unless you're providing it with the fiber substrate to do anything with, it's not going to do oh, a lot. You need to create the, you need to create the conditions in the gut lumen for it to produce the short chain fatty acids. You said that about a half an hour ago, but yeah, I've got that now. Okay, <laughs> so I've been shoveling talking about shoveling in these probiotics and things, but not talking enough about fiber. So yeah, you need the need the balance. Which which so this is this is international. This is not. I'm not. You know, I just know the UK based data, but there are you know, excellent papers out there just showing that you know every government agency recommends intake of at least I think min, like lowest is about twenty five grams a day, up to mm -hmm. some countries. I like think some Scandinavian countries are up to about forty, uh, which is just impossible to do on a daily basis. Um, but in terms of improving your gut health the simplest thing you can do is actually eat the recommended amount of fiber and that's but that's at the population level but now what you've got to think of it that's not going to be suitable for a an athlete or in terms of many athletes they're going to struggle for two reasons the major one being that you don't just produce short chain fatty acids which could be having this beneficial effect obviously fermentation is producing a lot of gas so many athletes will avoid like deliberately adopt low fiber diets throughout training and competition because they don't want the potential negative gastric effects of fiber and the other one being as well um athletes in weight category sports as well they avoid fiber because 
um, particularly these um, viscous or soluble fibers, they retain a lot of water. So mm -hmm. you can actually it gives you weight. exactly mm -hmm. gives you weight. So yeah, I, 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 I've looked previously in terms of to find, um, you know, compared to the general population, what is the fiber intake of a you know, elite athlete? And it's very hard to actually find, but I guess it would be low. I guess that they don't eat a lot of fiber. Unless they were vegetarian or vegan, then that's a, a different different that's situation. Yeah, I was just assuming that um, on average they'd be eating a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of um, yeah. pasta, and I thought they'd get a decent amount of fiber. But um, I uh, there's not that many that are not taking in fiber because they're worried about passing wind. <laughs> That's no, it's, it's, you look in the literature and it's a huge, like, I think there's this fear, obviously, rightly so, fear of gastric distress during competition. So oh, one, I thought you are talking about passing wind. You're talking about gastric. So you're saying if you produce a lot of gas from it, the fibre, it actually in, makes it more likely to have an upset stomach during exercise. Uh, upset exactly. You'd during have exercise. a huge bloating effect, which could oh. impact your, you know, it's all very well going, fantastic, I've produced these short chain fatty acids, but I bent over. <laughs> I thought you were talking about they didn't want to pass wind, you know, the baked bean effect. No, you're no. Talking about bloating know. during the exercise. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, I'm it's, finally it's, slow on the uptake today. Okay. The other one was... Um, was um, I'm just wondering, I don't know if people know this even, but lean versus obese people, people with diabetes, et cetera, do they have different microbiota, et cetera? Again, assuming they're having the same fiber. And That's the problem. Diet. It's more or less impossible. Like you obviously have a different um, microbiome in uh, obese individuals compared to lean in various like disease states associated with obesity compared to sort of healthy controls but in those studies it's it's impossible to identify what's being driven by the disease or the state compared to what the lifestyle so that we can do these food diaries you know in these individuals but whether they tell you the truth or not is mm -hmm. always debatable so it's, I, I think the, the majority of the difference you see is just driven by the excess energy intake um, in the in an obese individual all right okay so uh we've talked a lot about the um the short chain fatty acids and, and having effects on metabolism and fiber generally but the other uh interesting stuff you've done is you know appetite we've touched on so first i saw it was just a couple of weeks ago i saw the paper you just had it was in a nice journal i think it was, was it jay physio i think it was in a nice journal where you had um carbohydrate because i'm always interested in carbohydrate ingestion so you had carbohydrate ingestion with them without exercise effects on appetite so you know we haven't talked that much about appetite and that was really interesting and um, also because there's been more and more talk about this lactate um so lact fee um yeah. concept that when you exercise you get lactate high levels of lactate and that can inhibit your um appetite so this and it's a really a weird one because I, I always think why do you like really long exercise i'm totally starved if i don't eat but the idea, I guess, if you do short exercise, we haven't burned a whole bunch of calories, maybe, then your lactate is such, and, and who knows, the other things you'll talk about, um, can make you not want to eat for a while. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you go absolutely nuts, if you're a high, if someone with a whole bunch of fast twitch fibers and you do a 30 second sprint, not only will you, will you not want to eat, but you may actually throw up. So there's a mm. whole continuum here. Yeah, why don't you tell us about um, appetite, exercise, carbohydrate ingestion? It's very interesting. Um, so yeah, the work we published recently was again it was it was really trying to identify the consistent determinants of well say determinants but associates shall we say of both subjective appetite so how hungry you feel and what you eat in the post exercise period in both a fed and fasted state so a lot of the studies you know the control for diet by basically doing the studies in an overnight fasted state, or they'll get the volunteers to consume a standardized breakfast before the exercise. But because of obviously the impact of diet, that's going to have its own independent effects on appetite regulation, as well as the exercise. So what we try to do is that if you exercise 
on its own or exercise having just consumed some carbohydrate. Now, what we found is that by doing um, NMR met uh, metabolite profiling of the plasma samples, you get very different metabolite profile, like in the immediate post-exercise period and then 120 minutes later. But what we wanted to find is what were these consistent uh, determinants? Sorry, sorry, could you say, so just to get the protocol, so how long do they exercise, what is the intensity, but also the carbohydrate, did they just have it just straight before or do they have a couple of, you know, um, and then how so it was. It, sort of stuff? This was more of a physiological, so we have to sort of be open and honest that this was more of a physiological study than an actual probably something that would have direct applicability in terms of in everyday life so there was a rest and control trial where volunteers just remained rested and consumed water a rest and carbohydrate which was 75 grams of maltodextrin so a standard same amount as of, as an oral glucose tolerance test because that had been shown from previous data we had to produce nice robust changes in the um, plasma uh, metabolite profile. Um, then we had exercise with water and then the combination of the two. So we had this nice factorial design where we were able to identify the independent effects of carbohydrate ingestion, the independent effects of exercise and any interactive effects between the two. Um, and what we sort of found it as related to, um, so the exercise was 75% VO2 max, a high intensity um, exercise. Mm -hmm. But I think it was actually uh, close to 80% when we actually looked, it, it was you know, aimed at being 75%, it was actually closer to 80%. Um, and then there which was- Which is hard. A, which is hard, and, yeah. And, and for like 30 minutes or how long? 30, 30 minutes, so just 30, 30 minutes. minutes. Mm -hmm. um, with plasma samples, say, collected immediately post-exercise and then 120 minutes again. And at that time point, the volunteers were provided with a sort of standard, we use like a very large pasta meal where they can eat as much as they want. Uh, and what we identified is that um, GLP-1, the hormone GLP-1, which has these known anorectic effects, that if a volunteer secreted more GLP-1, they also were less they also uh, consumed less. And we also found the same with succinate as well. So we found these quite large, in, like, despite all these volunteers exercising at the same relative exercise intensity, um, we had this variation in how much succinate was appearing in the peripheral circulation. So if you were producing more succinate, you ate less. And again, we have to be that this is purely associ you know, asso association. So purely association. Can, I just say, can you just clarify? Is it is it correct that GLP one increases with the, so when you have a meal, GLP one increases, and you're saying it's an anorectic effect because yeah. it's telling you, okay, we've eaten, we don't need to eat more. But does exercise it? Because I think I saw in your intro you were thinking maybe it was going to be additive. Does exercise increase GLP one as well? Yeah, exercise increases GLP one as well, particularly high intensities of exercise. And again, the actual mechanism of why this occurs isn't very well known. And again, you get these quite large individual variabilities in the response as well. So for some people, um, you get exercise has this strong appetite suppressive effect. Whereas for some individuals like yourself, you say you can do a bout of exercise and feel ravenously hungry afterwards. So again, this was one of the intended outcomes of the work is to again try and work out well what are what what does vary between people which can explain their the impacts that it has on their um appetite response to exercise did you get the additive effect just or was it variable as well did you get glp1 increasing with exercise and then so, GL, with the, so, mm -hmm. so glp1 in terms of a statistical analysis they had independent effects so which would imply that they were they are additive. Um, so yeah, so if you ex if you exercise, you have an increase. If you consume carbohydrate, you have an increase. And if you combine the two, then th th it's based more it's a sum of those two, which is interesting, you know, and I think what we're going back to exercise, perhaps exercise and performance mainly, and, uh, as well as perhaps during exercise, how much role is GLP-1 having in terms of if you're consuming carbohydrate during exercise? that it's GLP-1 is known to have vast effects on the central nervous in terms of 
central fitting in. Um, yeah, um, it's about, it's how it has these effects on the appetite sort of feelings, but whether this could be altering the motivation to exercise, who knows? So it makes sense, I guess, if you have carbohydrates, it's going to go up and it's going to make you less likely to want to eat. Uh, yeah. You have exercise, though, that's interesting. So it goes up, makes you less likely to want to eat. You have carbohydrate plus exercise, it makes you even less likely to want to eat, which makes sense, I guess, because you've had the carbohydrate. But did you uh, did you have like questionnaires about how hungry are you, or is it just how much they picked out when they when they got yeah the well uh, so we always had the the visual analog scales we use, which are common tools just to measure how hungry people feel. And what's always really interesting is that there's a and this has been found in other studies as well that there's this dissociation between what people report on how hungry they are to what when what they actually then eat. Okay. At a buffet meal, the two are not directly correlated. But what we did show is that going back to what you mentioned with lactate, lactate had very strong, um, uh, in terms of the temporal change in response to exercise and in, in, in the post exercise period, that the levels of lactate did correlate um, strongly with how hungry people felt. Hmm. Okay, so that's that. Yeah, that's uh, maybe I, I actually Jonathan Long, I think it is, who's um, done that lack fee stuff. I've actually vaguely asked uh, if he could come on. I want him to come on, but I've sort of asked yeah. students and a guy I know is doing a postdoc with him. Um, so that would be interesting to talk about this lack fee business. But the idea is it's the lactate. Thing. So so your data, even though as you said, it's associations, yeah, would support that. Um, so was that the best correlation you, um, or was it more with the GLP-1? Well, it was just, or, it was simply GLP-1, succinate, you said. GLP-1 and succinate were the only two hormones and metabolites that um, correlated with like the actual food intake response post-exercise. So again, now it's there's been work done with succinate, so showing that it's produced by the exercised muscle, um, but you also get like uh, succinate produced by the gut microbiome as well. So that's what we're interested in is whether perhaps individual differences in gut microbiome succinate, is that actually um, altering what appears in the peripheral circulation and altering the appetite response? So again, we want to try and move this work beyond simple disc, you know, descriptive association and actually see, well, if you actually raise succinate levels in that post-exercise period, does that actually help you? Um, yeah, does that help re that reduce um, uh, energy intake and pre prevent in some people that compensatory increase in food intake that you get that can abolish any positive effect on um, energy balance? But there is, oh. if you look, at, so if you look at GLP one, there is nice evidence to suggest this could uh, you know, be a, a nice strategy to improve sort of the efficacy of exercise as a sort of weight loss tool. So there was um, an exercise training study done. So combining the exercise training with a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And again, what they sort of showed is that you got far superior weight loss when you combine mm -hmm. the exercise training with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. And that was associated with improved appetite regulation. So again, it's preventing that sort of feeling of ravenous hunger in the post-exercise period. That's what's um, well, that's required. The thing that's, that's so, that I'm wondering about because, as you're saying, your uh, study was suggesting they should be less hungry after exercise than if they hadn't exercised at all. Yeah. But then you're saying this ravenous, ravenously hungry. So you're saying, is it just a short term period that they're not as hungry? Or are you saying some people they don't really get that anorexic effect of exercise. It's, it's highly individual. Like, so that's, it's one of those, I'll copy a phrase from John Blundell, and I think it's that with these studies, you lose a lot from just looking at the mean response. The beauty is when you look at the individual responses that you can get people to do exactly the same bout of exercise and the, you know, the perceptions of appetite and hunger afterwards are completely different and it's what's nice as well this has been shown to be repeatable as well so studies have shown that you can you know get these individuals and do the exercise bout on two or three days and it's consistent some people feel really hungry some people have this suppression of appetite so again it's trying to identify well what is it about these people that's different 
Um, and can we actually you know, identify what it is, a particular you know, a biomarker that we can target to actually yeah, improve the appetite regulation in the post-exercise period? I guess it's very important, isn't it? Because a lot of people that exercise, actually I had an interesting comment, someone made a comment on Twitter or, or YouTube or something, saying that they were, they were pleased that the, the series of interviews I've done, often we're not really talking about um, weight loss. You know, often it's just the effect of exercise per se on, on things, which is, which is important because I'd often say to like medical doctors and things, um, you know, that you guys tend to focus on exercise being good because of weight loss, but exercise itself, you know, will increase in some sensitivity for 24 to 48 hours, et cetera, without yeah. changing weight loss. And that's an important message. Yeah, so I was thinking with, with you know, a lot of people are obviously exercising because they want to lose weight, you know, or it's part of their strategy, you know, diet yeah. and exercise. So I guess it's pretty important to understand what's going on there because people that are exercising and then don't feel hungry after exercise for a while, naturally yeah. that's going to be a better strategy, you know, to try and lose weight than, than people that exercise and then like eat as much or more because they just starve. Well, but there's, there's fascinating studies out there that have actually say, reported the individual responses to exercise training. And, the, you know, the best studies are where it's supervised exercise training. So, you know, these people have completed you know, 12 to 24 weeks of an exercise training program, which, you know, theoretically, if they were to have done, created that energy deficit with exercise and not compensated for it, you would lose, you know, kilos of, of body weight yet these people gain weight so <laughs> exercise is having an effect where it's actually oh, Herman, Herman Ponce is going to love you because I don't know yeah. if you know I had this guy yeah. Herman Ponce on and you know his big thing is that um, exercise doesn't really result in weight loss because you know it's you you know you reduce your other energy needs etc to make up for that and it's really just diet that produces it so um, yeah, it's kind of a controversial one Oh, well, my 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 understanding, and I would say it would be more this individual response on appetite. That some people, it just exercise just creates a state of intense hunger, where the actual energy intake that you get in response to doing more exercise is actually having you know, negative effects in terms of for weight loss. But again, it goes back to whether whether weight loss itself is in you know you're obviously going to get a whole host of other cardiometabolic benefits from the exercise independent of the weight loss but as a weight loss tool i think it's preventing that compensatory increase in appetite that's important so despite your studies showing that exercise um, produces appetite your overall feeling is that in the long term you actually eat as much or more um, well yeah it's the, I think the energy, it's again, it's that theoretical energy deficit you create is just threatened because of homeostatic processes that cause, and it's again, it's some people, it's not everyone, it's just some people mm -hmm. that they just have this rebound effect almost where yes. they will compensate by eating more no. than what the energy deficit So you're is. saying there's like a yo-yo just within the day, because we know, of course, people do yo-yo when they lose a bunch of weight over, you know, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 20 yeah. weeks, whatever, they'll tend to go back. And Joe Pareto here, I was going to say here in Australia, but I'm in Copenhagen. But, um, Joe Pareto, uh, who is actually a great um, obesity researcher and actually did our muscle biopsy, which you might be HD. Um, now he's shown that people lose weight and then their hunger hormones, you know, ghrelin and leptin, and yeah, yeah. You know, things that affect hunger, they just like say eat 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 until until you get back to your original weight. <laughs> yeah. depressing. So well, that's, that's why it's more long term. Going back, to, going back to that study where they can then combine the exercise training with a GLP one receptor agonist to so sort of maintain high levels of this appetite suppressing hormone mm -hmm. that showed to be highly effective. So again, are there ways that we can hijack the body, you know, body's hormones and metabolite system in that post exercise period to really prevent? that compensatory response occurring okay so now just back to the i've got some questions on twitter and I, I know you're not you're not actually on twitter right yeah no um, i i i i no, right. never I, I i said about no. 20 10 how many years ago it was going it was a fad it will never last oh there you go yeah like <laughs> the internet in Bitcoin. yeah, yeah. so 
Yeah, I just don't know how some people find the time. It amazes me. Some oh, people yeah. Say, Trust me, I never did it until I started the podcast. And now I find it's really good to get the message out. But also I asked for questions and I, I was um I didn't actually fill you in on all of them, but I sent a couple. Um okay. so yeah, David said, uh, what changes in the gut occur over the course of a grand tour? Pogachar, who ended up getting second, who's won it twice before, was clearly having some gastric issues in this year's Tour de France. So who knows if that's the reason? But um, any ideas during really high, extremely demanding exercise for 21 days, 21 stages, 23 days, two, two rest days, any idea what effect that would have? And I guess they're changing well, their food intake massively as well. I am not aware of any study that would have looked at you know, not even elite athletic performance, but, you know, repeated bouts of elite performance and collected repeated stall samples and looked for those levels of changes. But, you know, it'd be fascinating to see whether there is a, you know, a marker in stall in terms of both either compositionally or from met metabolite activity that, you know, predicts if someone is going to have that, those GI symptoms that cause them to withdraw. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But again, it would be yeah, really I, interesting to collect. But yeah. I actually saw on Twitter that, you know, there's always been talk, you know, like, oh, how much carbohydrate should people have? And, you know, sometimes they talk about eight to 10 grams per kilogram. Apparently they're having like 18 grams per kilogram or something per day. <laughs> Just incredible amounts. And then the exercise. So, the, you know, we talked a bit about exercise, um, carbohydrate interactions. But I think all of that would go out the window because they don't wait till they're hungry. You know, you'll see they finish and they're just piling it in for the next stage. They don't, I don't think it's, the hunger sort of kicks in anyway. But that amount of digestible carbohydrate, like, mm. do you reach a saturation point where, like, my thing would be in some individuals, do you actually break that down through like you no know, enzyme process and let that become available? Or, does a lot of that digestible carbohydrate actually then get further down the gut and start to be fermented and actually maybe that's are, why they go so quickly they're producing a lot of hot air out the back yeah exactly <laughs> it's just a lot of gas mm. um wow. yeah it just wouldn't yeah it's just i does are we able to just put that amount of carbohydrate in that's amazing yeah i i'd never heard of or even thought of that sort of level but it came yeah. from one of the dietitians, I think that's in, I'm with one of the professional teams. So, uh, yeah. uh, and then Angela said um, M. So M equals mind, muscles, microbiota, and Mediterranean, uh, hoping to be active long term. So I guess yeah, mind. Now, what about oh, we've touched on this obviously with appetite, but what about things like this? You know microbiota every every day there's something else that it does so again i don't know sorry to throw all this at you but um you know anxiety depression um do you know much about that i guess is are, are these short chain fatty acids well actually at first part of me thinks it's too simple to think there's only short chain fatty acids that are actually exactly i'm only mentioning those because they're the things that i research most often there's a, <laughs> there's a whole enough. host of um, like metabolites produced by the gut. So secondary bile acids, there's products of um, protein like fermentation or degradation that are important and a whole host of immune signals as well. So okay. it's far more complicated than short chain fatty acids. But And do we know if these things cross the blood brain barrier? Do we know? Um, I mean, a few days ago when we talked, you, 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 you felt like quite a lot of this stuff, it's not as clear cut as people think or that only been shown in animals or whatever do you have any idea about um that that you know it literally it's like it's like every single thing is affected but, but then again i guess 20 years ago or whatever we never thought you know we thought exercise was just affecting the heart maybe in the lungs and the muscles now we know that there's you know things released from the muscle myokines yeah. that are affecting like every organ and you know and that we you know the, the liver's talking to the muscle and the muscles talking to the liver and and, um, you know, it probably wouldn't be that surprising if everything's talking to everything because we're extremely integrated, but it's very complicated. Exactly. Well, just what I know is that from the like, large epidemiological studies that have collected um, stool samples and, and looked at microbiota composition, there are links with um, like depression-like symptoms and anxiety 
But again, it's a, it's a lot of it is this associative data. And I think there's a far less randomized controlled trials where people have then tried to manipulate their speak, like the bacterial species or the metabolites and showing that it has had any effect. So again, it's very hard, like a lot of this area, to move beyond simple association. Okay. And and can we assume even that um, whatever's getting uh, fermented by the by the uh, whatever fibers being fermented and showing up in the blood or you know going taken up by the first pass by the liver or whatever, can we assume that all of it's like good? You know, I, I assume there's, there's some things that are going to have positive effects, some things going to have negative effects. Might even have positive effects in one organ, and it might be having negative effects on your mood. You know, like it's probably. Do we even know? Like, is is all fiber and all breaking down fiber a good thing, or is it is it too simple, or we just don't know yet? It's probably too simple. It's probably um, depends on the physiological context as well. Like, we did a just out. We did a study a couple of years ago where we took patients with uh, fatty liver disease. So they had a biopsy mm -hmm. diagnosis of fatty liver disease. Um, and we gave them um, uh, inulin, which is a dietary fiber, thinking off, oh, we you know, increase the short chain fatty acid levels. This will work through liver metabolism and reduce their liver fat levels. And it actually had the opposite effect. So whether Increase. in that situation, the liver metabolism in these people with fatty liver disease is completely different. And perhaps if you're like providing particularly lots of acetate, which I said is lipogenic, do, do these people just convert that into more fat? More fat. Man. And again, like you can't assume that what you'll see in a healthy individual will be the same as someone with a disease state, mm. I think. And I guess whenever you give a system something, it has to do something with it. So if you've exactly. given it inulin, it goes to the liver and it doesn't actually, it's like, well, thanks, but I don't actually need to pump out more anything. I don't really need to make more fats to pump out somewhere. Yeah. I'll just have well, to store this as fat. Yeah, my, my, the liver you know, enzyme machinery in someone with fatty liver disease is probably going to be switched on more to be fat storage than oxidation. So if you're going to provide more of a substrate, it's probably going to store it. That's what we assumed anyway. But it just yeah. really just showed that difference between, I think, fiber having more preventative effects than curative, if that makes sense. That right. that might be with that. Now, another paper I saw of yours, which was interesting, and I wonder if it's if we know the cause and effect again, is that higher dietary fiber intake is associated with increased skeletal muscle mass and strength in adults age 40 and older. Now, my first thought was, is that just because people that have high dietary fiber are maybe more healthy generally, et cetera? Or do you think that's having a, a you know, per se effect? Again, in, in that study, we tried our best with the available outcomes were, that were available to include as many covariates as possible, which could explain it. So. I think every other sort of major macronutrient intake, so particularly things like saturated fat, sugar intake, uh, and also physical activity and sedentary time, we're all controlled for. So mm -hmm. we are confident or vaguely confident it is an independent effect of fibre per se. So if, once you get to 40 plus, the more fibre you had in your diet, so it was associated with improved um, uh, uh, appendicular lean mass um, and importantly I think that's what that alone but we also had the hand grip data as well to show better strength as well so again what we're trying to do uh, this is just one of those bitter researcher moments we're trying to get work funded to take middle like it's very hard to get stuff funded to sort of prevent we've sort of found sort of prevent preventative medicine or preventative dietary work or preventative exercise is very difficult to uh, really uh, attract funding. But what we'd like to obviously do is take um, a group of individuals, particularly with a low fiber diet, and over a course of say, a you know, prolonged period of time where you might see an appreciable change in muscle mass and strength, actually show it does have a positive effect on muscle mass or perhaps prevent any further deterioration in muscle mass that you get from 
uh, ages 40 plus. Um, and again, going back to mechanistically, we think that that most likely explanation for the impact of fibre with muscle mass would be due to the what we think, um, due to the, this effect of um, particularly butyrate, this short chain fatty acid, and in terms of perhaps maintaining um, this gut barrier, so preventing sort of the development of um, a cr like chronic inflammation which is particularly coming from the gut, which would have these, this influence on uh, muscle mass or the mechanism. Oh, so you think it's the chronic, ah, oh, so you think it's the, okay, so the, so the fermentable fiber is having beneficial effects on these colonocytes, perhaps. You're saying exactly. the what, cells what, in the colon, less inflammation, and therefore the whole body inflammation will be less and whole body inflammation can reduce muscle mass. Is that what you're saying? That would be that would be our working hypothesis. And after we published that paper, there was um, in it's about three or four independent studies in different cohorts, where they had a control group versus people with low muscle mass, and there was this consistently lower levels of butyrate in the group with the lower muscle mass. So again, it's just tying it back with our own work, whether if you consume more fiber, do you actually maintain this preferred energy source for the gut? And are you just basically, with old age, stopping your gut disintegrating, essentially, and basically keeping things in the lumen and stopping that inflammation uh, occurring okay. systemically that would influence muscle mass and other processes? So for practical takeaway messages here, would you say that um, as people get older, they the fibre? Because I know people tend to go, I don't know the data, but people always talk about as people get, as people get older, they tend to sort of just drink cups of tea and eat biscuits, this, things like that. Well, this is, know. Uh, you know, this is one of the issues with trying to, particularly in older adults, like if you're trying to do an intervention study to get them to eat more fibre, they're not going to do it they're not, they don't want to eat more fiber. You, as with age, it becomes, you know, they don't want, you get in some people who have reduction in appetite anyway. So introducing more foods into the diet, more, you know, particularly uh, things that they struggle to eat in terms of there's ink, like it takes, the more uh, high fiber foods that you have in your diet, you know, they take longer to cook. They're sometimes more expensive as well. So the, the base, there's lots of barriers that stop people eating fibre, which are a lot more commonly reported in older populations. So it is very difficult to actually, particularly in older adult populations, to get them to eat more fibre. That's, that's a worry. OK, well, this fits there, therefore with another Twitter question from Ollie. What, if any, changes occur in the gut with increased age? So I guess you're talking... He's asking about the gut, you're talking about them having this fiber. And do these have implications during exercise and for health? So do you notice the gut itself change with age? Uh, or is it more than just they don't need so much fiber? Um, the best, I'd recommend Paul O'Toole's work at the University of Cork. He's done fantastic uh, work looking at age-related changes in the gut microbiome. So it isn't just dietary changes, so you see with age. Um, physical activity obviously has an effect. There's increased medication usage, so particularly antibiotics. Um, and again, you just get anatomical and physiological changes with age, particularly reduced di like enzyme secretion into the gut. So if you're not producing the enzyme to break down the digestible carbohydrate, it's going to get further down the gut again and actually behave like a fibre because it's not been digested uh, and the other mass the other important one they identified was uh, social interactions that we get lots of bacteria just from um oh, picking them between up. ourselves and obviously if you become if you become older more socially isolated there's that less opportunity to actually pass on different uh, uh, bacteria between people but it but going back to the, the but all of those factors do combine that you do actually see these age-related changes in the gut microbiome, and one of them being um, the loss of these commensal or beneficial bacterial taxa. So, what, so not just short-chain fatty acid producers, but other things as well. Um, and these uh, pathobionts, so, so these basically bacterial species that can contribute to disease progress 
in you know, certain environmental conditions. Yeah, I just, I just realised, I don't know if we've actually, we've talked a lot about exercise, but have we actually talked about whether exercise affects the gut microbiome? I don't, I don't know if we have. <laughs> uh, I don't think we have, but the, the short answer is yes, it does. So based on stool sample collection, if you, you know, both acutely and from chronic exercise training studies show um, that you do get um, uh, yeah, changes in the gut microbiome composition. Yeah, and, the, and are these, again, it's complicated, but are these generally thought to be beneficial changes? Yeah, well, for, from my own perspective, sorry to bring it back to short chain fatty acids, but you do see increases in short chain fatty acids. So I can't remember the name of the author, but the best, I think there's one very good paper um, in terms of the benefit that what that has, it took a group of sedentary individuals, got them to do an exercise training program where they looked at the changes. And then they also collected stool samples after they'd returned back to a sedentary lifestyle. And they showed that these changes did go back. So it was okay. directly related to the actual um, increased energy load that was uh, occurring. Okay, and any idea of the time um the acute change you get quite like particularly if you've done very high intensity exercise so studies have done where they post marathon or post iron man uh, events where they've collected stool samples and you show dramatic differences compared to like pre-race stool samples okay. so yeah it's a huge effect on the gut but again it's not really i'm not really um i haven't been able to find it sort of physiologically why exercise would alter the back, you know, bacterial composition is it mm. no chicken does it alter ph does it alter the oxygen you know, levels of oxygen saturation or is it just through changes in the gastric emptying time that then is altering how food is processed and that you are just getting completely different um substrates in parts of the gut that you wouldn't have if you remain sedentary that's true because I mean we you know it's been known forever that when you exercise you reduce your um, gastrointestinal tract um, yeah you know motility and how long things take to go through and you were saying earlier if you slow that down you have more time oh so what would happen there uh, more time to absorb it and this this will get through to the large intestine yeah. is that right yeah okay so that would reduce your short chain fatty acids maybe. Theoretically, it would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I guess there's also all the hormonal changes. Who knows, like, this adrenaline and cortisol. Actually, you had something about, what was that about? You had something about glucagon. So you get changes in, yeah, ex during exercise, you get increases in glucagon, decreases in insulin, increases in adrenaline, increases in cortisol, depending on intensity and duration. Um, who knows what effect all these things have. Well, we became interested in glucagon because we thought it could be a, a hormone that explained the post-exercise appetite responses, and in particular, the individual differences. Uh, but it, we showed no relationship with glucagon release with X. It, well, there was a, a, exercise did have a significant main effect of glucagon, but it wasn't associated at all with any of the appetite responses that we had. Uh, and then we did a systematic review and meta-analysis where we looked at what influence glucagon infusions have on energy intake and it doesn't there didn't seem to be any consistent impact of glucagon on energy intake whereas it has these considerable impacts on energy expenditure okay great all right now you mentioned something about sex differences earlier but i missed it so i know with your carbohydrate versus exercise you know like two by two design that was in men now you said something i wanted someone sent a question question through other sex differences angela uh, with, I guess, the gut, gut microbiome, um, appetite, do you know? You said something earlier, sorry, I forgot what it was. I find, I, there is, again, the gut microbiome project work would be the best source to look at this, but I'm, there are gender differences, but I think it's when you look at the you know, percentage explanation, it's, it's minimal when you compare it to other lifestyle factors. And I think it might even be during certain stages of life, particularly where uh, during puberty, where you have these large considerable differences in sex hormones. And again, in women post-menopause, there appears to be these shifts in the gut microbiome. So again, there are gender differences, but again, the extent of the effect compared to other factors, I don't think is as large. Okay. Don't hold me to that. 
All right. So that maybe maybe there is a hormonal because uh, after you know the classic post post menopause there's, there's estrogen, of course. Yeah. Okay. So what about this is a one um, one of the questions I sometimes ask is uh, what are the controversies in the field? There's probably a fair few controversies in this field. Um, I say contra it's not really controversies. I think that the gut microbiome has been very guilty into the, the field of probably overemphasizing its important, particularly from highly controlled rodent studies showing that you know, particular species, particular gut uh, metabolites can affect various disease states. But it's always that translation to humans is always um, incredibly difficult. So any paper that's only been shown in rodent models always treat with a bit of skepticism until there's any human data to back it up. Um, again, it does, I don't, it's not saying that anything, the data within these studies is particularly wrong. It's, we just know that the gut microbiome is so responsive to a whole host of um, you know, external drivers. So if a rodent study showed that a, a particular probiotic was highly beneficial, um, then that may, might, might be the case. But if one of us goes out on a Friday night and sinks you know, five or six pints, whereas the other one doesn't, that's probably going to have a lot more benefit on the gut microbiome than the, you know, this uh, probiotic. So, yeah, it's just lifestyle factors in free living humans are just so difficult to control mm. for their influence on the gut microbiome. Actually, just, just that extreme case you there, well, it's not that extreme, five or six pints, but it made me think of um, I've I been known to chocolate. Sorry? Yeah, I toned it down. Known... <laughs> oh, okay. I've been known to um, eat a lot of chocolate, and you, and you might think, yeah. oh, that's probably going to mess up my microbiome. But then I exercise every day as well. So, you know, do we know those interact? I, I'm sure they don't know. Like, no one's done a study like eat 200 grams of chocolate, plus or minus going for a ride, two hour ride afterwards. What happens to your microbiome? Now, the data is really, again, the field is still in its relative infancy, and particularly like diet and exercise factors. The studies are always really controlled, like in terms of they control for one factor over the other. So if you're looking at the influence of chocolate on the gut microbiome, they would always standardize the amount of exercise participants have had, so mm -hmm. to, you know, to rule that out. And again, I think it's the interactions between the two that are you know, fascinating. Again, if you have your chocolate and you exercise before or after, how does that influence the, you know, what happens to the gut microbiome then? Funnily enough, I just remembered now, we did a study here on PhD and we were doing these different carbohydrates and it was to do with funding that we actually did, ended up doing a solid versus liquid because, because we got money from a chocolate right. company. So they were eating chocolate during exercise. So it could be before, during or after exercise. Yeah. Okay, now I think if we covered, um, what I like to do towards the end is have a bit of a takeaway messages. Have we covered everything pretty much? Because I almost forgot about exercise per se. Yeah, so, oh no, so. I think we've, we've covered, uh, um, yeah. A range of subjects. It's been, uh, yeah, good. It's been like, been well, like I thought about some tech. Enjoyed it. Pardon? What's that? It's been like a therapy session. I've enjoyed oh, it. Oh, I'm such a calming influence. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. So, what about some takeaway messages we'd like people to get out of this chat? Um, my one is always eat more fiber. That's by far, mm -hmm. it, even just at the vast majority of us simply do not eat enough fiber uh, and encourage. Always, always consider fiber as its influence it could be yeah. having. Um, the other take home message is I think the uh, something, it, I think the field of the gut microbiome is moving on. I think that there were a paper published in I think it was the start of June um, where they, someone has developed these um, capsules that you ingest that are then able to collect samples from the gut lumen at specific different parts. So because of the changing pH through the gastrointestinal tract, once it gets to a certain pH, it collects, say, for, I think it's 400 microliters of fluid. So that then, once it's passed out, you're then able to do the microbiome analysis and the, uh, uh, yeah, and the uh, met metabolite uh, profile as well. Um, and I think that though... The, that kind of technology is really going to advance our understanding of um, the gut microbiome. 
So eat eat more fiber. Oh, sorry, that's that's interesting. But yeah, take away. So eat more fiber. And what about so exercise? Looks like it's good. Yeah, and probiotics maybe, or you know these these fermented things. But would you come back to? I mean, exercise is good for you anyway. Yeah. But would you basically come back? The main thing is just eat more fiber. Is that right? My, that would be mine. Eat more fiber. That's the uh, eat the eat eat the recommended amount of fiber. Oh yeah. And whether either via whole food if necessary, or if not, there's a range of supplements that are available which you can add to your commonly ingested food to get that extra five to 10 grams per day. All right, well, thank you, Ed. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, uh, it's been a pleasure. Great. Okay, see you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.